Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that, make sure you're, not you, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Speaking of subscriptions, I don't know what it'll be like by the time you see this series, but uh, as of July 5th, um, I'm just shy of 900, so I really want to get to 1,000 by the end of the year. For nothing else, just so I can hit the 1,000 mark. And then if something magical happens where I hit 4,000 watch hours annually in a rolling 12-month period and keep my at least 1,000 subscribers. Maybe I'll make like 5 bucks a month. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it would be nice. Anyway, uh, this is part four, part four of a six-part series of Chilean Carmenere. Like all the wines in this series, this is a free sample and I have free reign to review it however I wish. Now, way back in episode 99 of the current era, the WWTV era, um, God, sounds like wrestling, right? Anyway, I did a detailed segment on Chilean wine. Nothing really has changed uh, from that. So if you want to know more, then hit the link in the description below and watch basically the first seven minutes. That episode's links also include a ton of resources. Today's wine comes from Primus, or Primus, probably Primus. It is the 2020 Primus Carmenere. I mentioned them in my review of the Veramonte Sauvignon Blanc a few years ago. They're part of the Gonzalez Bias family of wines. They include Veramonte, Neyen, and this wine, Primus. The website for Neyen, the winery that makes Primus, is short on history. Uh, spoiler alert, I do have another wine from these guys coming up in a few weeks from a different set that was sent to me by a different group of people. And I'll be honest, when I see, I say Primus, but I'm trying to, it's probably Primus because that should be how it's pronounced in Spanish. But in my head, it's Primus because that's how we pronounce the word in English. Anyway, they, as in the, the winery, they state that they are a pioneering regenerative, or, regenerative organic and biodynamic winery in Apalta. Not Alpalta, but Apalta. Because that's also another one of those words that I mess up all the time. They also mentioned that vines date back to 1889. Neyende Apalta appears to be the modern version of what was founded in 1889, though they have what they call a centennial cellar. That is a cellar at least 100 years old. Other than that, just know that, that since they are part of Gonzalez Bias, they have winemaking roots, winemaking roots that now stretch back to Spain since 1835. So while the Nayan site doesn't really tout their history, they have a lot of it. If you want to check out the Veramonte review, feel free to click the link below. It doesn't really contain any extra info for our purposes here, but it does have a lot of good info in general. What do you need to know about regenerative agriculture is that it's very much like old school agriculture with a focus on crop rotation uh, and no tilling and a few other things. Now this may be true where every year you plant different crops on your farm probably several crops that you possibly rotate around your farm. For crops like wine grapes, you can't do that, but you can have multiple crops in the vineyard or at least something like a cover crop. So it might be not something you, you are harvesting per se, but you can have multiple crops in your vineyard. Uh, this rotation or cover crop helps replenish nutrients that, other crop, that, that another crop took out of the soil. So by doing this rotation, you keep your soil in good health. This also applies to livestock. In that scenario, you have your livestock grazed for a certain amount of time in one section and then shift them to another. Over time, they will have rotated around your ranch and the grasses they feed on will have been restored and the livestock is providing the fertilizer. And while you can do this with intensive or conventional farming, typically you're at least farming organically, if not biodynamically, or a combination of the two. Let's travel to the Colchagua Valley and specifically the Apalta Dio. It's a small appellation and it's a fairly premium appellation as well. But the winery is not located there. It's actually located less than five miles to the east. That's not entirely accurate. What? Which part? 
The Santa Cruz DO is where the winery is, and the Apalta DO is a sub-appellation of, of Santa Cruz. It's next to impossible to find the Apalta DO on a Chilean wine map. Most Chilean wine maps are actually pretty bad. And when you do find it on a map, it's poorly located. Anyway, after doing some deep searching to try to find some kind of definition, all I found was this in a, in the, in a regulation that defines the Santa Cruz DO. Quote, Apalta, whose limit is defined by the rural town of the same name in the commune of Santa Cruz. End quote. That's it. So what you're seeing is my best guess based on various websites that describe the Apalta Dio as a horseshoe-shaped valley. Especially since there doesn't seem to be a town named Apalta on its own, but there are two towns in the valley uh, with Apalta that, that, has, that has Apalta as part of their names. Sorry, wait. There are two towns in the valley with Apalta as part of their names. Uh, Milahue de Apalta and San Jose de Apalta. All right. Anyway... Uh, also, I think, I think this, I think this winery's web, no, it's another website, their, their winery's website said that the river is the southern border of the, the Apalta Valley, the Valle de Apalta. So I'm pretty sure I got it all correct. Anyway, uh, how about the wine? Well, the Primus brand appears to have been wines made from several places in Chile in the past. At least that's how it's described on the webpage. I've sold the brand for many years and I, honestly can't remember what appellations it had on the label. From the web website, they included Casablanca and the Maipo Valley. Now they only come from Apalta. Know what other wine comes from Apalta? The flagship Nayen. While it's not explicitly stated, my guess is that the Primus uh, label is the second label of Nayen. Well, it is the second label because it's a lot less expensive than Nayen. Um, now let's get the stats for this wine. The 2020 Primus Carmenere, suggested retail price, $21. From the Apalta Dio, it's Carmenere, I assume it's 100%, I'm assuming it's 100%, certified sustainable chili, made with organic grapes with eco -cert certification, certified vegan, aging 18 months, 18% 18 of which is new French oak, and 82% second use or older French oak. Uh, ABV is 14.5, the TA is 4.94 grams per liter, the pH 3.77, the RS 2.2 grams per liter. Let's get into the wine. All right, 14.5, big boy. pH a little high, acid not terribly high. So we'll check it out. So there are a few other Chilean wines that come from Apalta and they're pretty pricey. Okay. So this is, you've got some, uh, some really good, um, kind of in a high rent district. Let's just put it that way. All right. I know it's 12 years old, but I love this shirt. Color. A little bit deeper in color. More really a deep ruby on this. Um, it's really not translucent at all. It's, I wouldn't say completely opaque, but it's, it's getting there. Okay, let's dissect this. So fruit is what comes to the forefront. Um, there's a bit of booziness to it. There's a little bit of like... Um, uh, what should we call it? Maraschino or Marachino, uh cherry, raspberry, but it's like it's in a syrup. It's almost like sweet, you know, very, very, very ripe smelling. But also, you can kind of smell the alcohol, so it's kind of like a little, a little bit um, boozy. So it's like a raspberry cherry um, thing going on but like in, in, in syrup and maybe you put a little shot of vodka in there. So it's kind of, it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of boozy. That's fine. And that's really, I don't really get much earth. I really don't get anything pyrazinic in it, which is fine, but it's very, very fruity. Let's, uh, let's check out how it tastes. So, 
yeah, you can you can tell this this is a big boy. 14, 5, it might even be 15. Um, like technically it might be 15. Um, but it's re it's juicy, delicious, fruity. I feel it's very American palate. Um it's made, for, I don't know how much of this actually sold in Chile, but I feel it's definitely made for the American market. Would I identify this as Carmenere? Probably not. Um, red wine tastes good. I probably would put it in a red blend um, type of thing because I don't really get anything that just screams Carmenere to me. Or Bordeaux grapes. I mean, even just Bordeaux grapes. I mean, other than like, if you told me this came from California, I'd be like, yeah, it comes from California. I'd, I'd agree with it. With that said, there is a there is a touch of earthiness and rusticity. So if if I sat back with the wine and, and was instead of like going off of just initial gut, I might take it outside the United States. Let's roll back the comments a little bit. There is a spiciness to it, but it's not necessarily bell pepper. And it's not necessarily... Um, cumin or jalapeno, the, 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 the big three, I guess I'm going to call them from now on. Um, with that, it's just like a, a spicier thing. Not even like the tahini comment I made, I think it was last week's wine. Um, it's just kind of a, a spicier version of red fruit. It tastes really good though. So I'll put it this way. What I consider this, what would I be like, if I was trying to show somebody what a Chilean carbonara is like if I wanted to give them an example of Chilean Carmenere, I wouldn't use this wine. Um, if I wanted to give a wine to somebody that's around twenty bucks, that's going to taste good, it's going to go with a lot of different food items. I have to say Carmenere on the front label. I'd be like, yeah, this is a tasty wine. Um, it's not sweet at any you know by any means. Um, so it's not. So in some ways, it's not quite the American palate because a lot of your wines that are going to be in this price range are probably approaching semi-sweet level where they back sweeten the wine. Um, you know, it could be a 14% wine and it may have six, seven, eight, nine grams per liter of sugar. Um, I wouldn't call it RS because it's not residual. You're not getting nine grams per liter of residual sugar from fermentation. Um, this is not happening. You're adding grape must if it's in the form of mega purple um, or just flat out inverted sugar. This does not have any of that. This is truly a fruity wine that's elevated alcohol that tastes delicious. It tastes, it kind of tastes more expensive than, than it's letting on. Like if you told me there's like 25 to 30, I mean, we're not going to like 50 bucks, but 25 to 30, I'm like, okay, I do like it. I feel like there's a little bit of black fruit in here. I think as it's opening up, the fruit is becoming more in the background and the earthiness is starting to become more prominent. It's getting drier, okay? Um, it's getting earthier. So it has the initial attack. We first pour it, that it's going to appeal to Americans. But now it's kind of settling into its own. Aroma-wise, it's still pretty much the same. It hasn't really changed much. My mouth is watering, even though, what was the, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not high TA by any means in the pH, so the intensity, but my mouth feels like it's watering. There is, oh wow, there's, okay, it's taking a while. So there is the briefest hint of cumin now coming out. I kind of got the enchilada thing going on. This might be a wine that you probably, this might be a wine you have to decant or just let it sit open for a while. Yet the pyrazines are starting to come through. I even get a little bit of bell pepper jalapeno. Someone's watching videos in the background, so you might have heard something. I don't know. The um, noise reduction I use is really good. I think this is a wine that probably needs to open up a little more. It's what, a 2020, so it's already four years old. So it's not that it needs to age per se, but I think I think this wine is, I think it wine needs time. I think it needs some time and it will kind of settle into some things. It might be just in a phase where it's kind of fruit forward. I wouldn't call it disjointed, but I feel like it's 
it's kind of moving through a bunch of things right now in the glass. And uh, if I let it sit open for a while, it might kind of finally settle into that is Chilean Carmen Air. It may not be kind of there at this moment. I think it's just, again, it comes across as something that's got a red blend quality to it. Not necessarily, oh, I can identify a specific grape or a single grape on it. With that said, it tastes good. It's not expensive. You know, $22, $21, $21. So, I mean, I like the wine. And I can definitely suggest that if you're just looking for a good tasting red wine that has a bit of fruitiness to it, um, eventually gets you a little bit of earthiness, maybe a touch of spice, you know, has a lot of subtleties going on, but it's just something that just tastes good. It, it does taste good. I like it. Just wasn't what I expected. All right, well, that's going to do it for today's show. Uh, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and tell your friends. And we'll see you next time again with another Chilean Carbonara.